much for coming tonight. Wait a month. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Holly Seif, artist extraordinaire. As I said to Jocelyn earlier, let's get this party started. <laughs> so, hello and welcome to the artist lecture talk on my solo show, Nightlights. My name is Pauline Seif, as Jocelyn had said so. I personally want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your Thursday evening to attend this lecture. So thank you very, very much. But first, before I get started, I need to thank Kimberly Munson. If you don't know who Kimberly Munson is, she is a local artist, she's also a sculptor, she's also a sculpture instructor at the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts here in North Lyme. She is the one who was the juror for the associate member show back in January 2020. And she's the one who juried in my painting Twilight Romance, which is downstairs in the solo show. Not only did she jury it in, but she also awarded me first place. Hence the reason why I've been given a solo show and also this lecture, <laughs> which is very new to me. So, that said, I originally, I knew I was an artist when I was a young kid. And I was always drawing and I was always painting and I just knew that I was supposed to be an artist. And as I was growing up and discovering all of this, I realized I had an affinity for maritime art. I was inspired by Jack Sperling. I was also inspired by Montague Dawson. And I was also inspired by John Stobart, who is still with us today, which is great. John Stobart was introduced to me by my dad. My dad had collected a few of his prints. And we had them in the house, and it was just very exciting to grow up with those paintings, those prints. And my dad said, hey, if you like maritime artwork so much, you should really check out John Stobart's work. And so I did. My parents decided <clears throat> to buy one of his books of, of his. And it's one of those ginormous coffee table size books, and it's about that thick. And it's full of some of his work. Not all of it, but some. And I was enthralled. I was like, wow, this is so exciting. John Stobart's work, he's a maritime artist. He's well known, his life is gorgeous. He has a sense of history. That, this, that got me very excited as a young artist. And so, John Stobart had a gallery space in downtown Pittsburgh. That's where I'm originally from, is Pittsburgh. And it was in and around my birthday that my parents said, let's go meet John Stobart because he has his annual visit to his gallery <coughs> in Pittsburgh. Of course, you know, I'm 17 years old. I was like, oh my God, really? This is my idol. So I was so excited. We went down to his gallery in early November and I brought my portfolio with me, and it was when I saw him in his gallery space, it was total fangirling. Oh, he's here, he's here. And so John Stobart was obliging enough to look at my portfolio, and he felt that I had something going on. And he said that I should continue my art education at the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts here in Old Lyme. And of course, I took his word as gold. So I got convinced my parents to go up to Connecticut several months later to check out the school. And at the time, the school was still under construction, the Chamber Studio. The big parking lot was nothing but gravel. And there was something about the Lyme Academy growing that really intrigued me as a young girl. And I thought, wow, this is the school I want to go to. And I walked among the halls. And I saw the figure drawings, and I saw the still life paintings and the landscape paintings. I was so excited. So in 1995, that's when I made my decision. So that's the school I'm going to. And a few months later, I got my acceptance into the academy, and 
And I moved up here in August of 1996, and I've been a Connecticut resident ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And after I had graduated from school, the plan was for, for myself kind of to follow John Stobart's footsteps. I wanted to be a maritime artist and a plein air artist. So I took those skills of studio and plein air and moved forward. So I started to focus on that, and I think just the course of how things go, I got a little derailed. And that happened in 2002 when I had a house fire and I lost 90% of my studio. That shifted my focus from doing historical maritime art and plein air to doing more studio work. And so in 2003, I developed the binocular series. And that was my take on doing something contemporary in the marine art world. So I had these little binoculars and I would look at the horizon and I would see all the boats passing by, and I put them into a horizontal format, really long and really narrow. And I just ran with that for years. And that basically became my signature as, a, as an artist with my binocular series. And then in 2005, when I had moved to Uncasville to be with my current boyfriend, <laughs> <laughs> I started to just look at the surroundings of where I was and realized, hey, this place is kind of cool. And as you can see, this painting right here, this is my first urban night scene ever. This was done from my studio window in Uncasville. And for me, it was just thrilling because I was able to sit there in my studio, look out the window, and that's what I saw. I was so excited. And then I looked a little farther to my left, and this was my driveway, looking at a storage facility. I just, there was something about the quality of light and the silhouette that I was really intrigued by. And then we had a blizzard not too much later, and this was done from our kitchen window, right in front of the sink, just do it right there. And this was done in one night. And I think this one was done in a few nights. And that's that one too. So this is basically where I stopped in 2005. You know, I started the night scenes and then I stopped because I started building up my binocular series again and there was more of a demand for that. And so I just focused on the binoculars for a good 10 years. Never thought about the night scenes again. Then we started getting iPhones. <laughs> so we could take pictures with us everywhere and anywhere and all the time. So there was one February night where I just felt like driving around town because I wanted to do a little bit more than what was just outside my window. I wanted to see more of Uncasville, where I currently live, at night. So I drove around and I discovered this scene. And I thought, wow, look at that light. That is so cool. So I took a picture and went home, thought about it, and ended up making a panel for it and just painting that, I think in four days, maybe three. It was just so much fun. And I realized, this is so great. Night scenes. It's so much different from, you know, the typical work that I had been doing for 10 years. The maritime work, where it's always bright and sunny and everything is specifically placed, so it's pleasing. And it's always accurate with maritime artwork, so there's kind of a, a lack of creativity and elasticity with that. But with the night scenes, it's free range. You, know, you, have, you can do whatever you want, basically. So the night series, I need to consult my phone. My apologies for that part. Ah, here we go. So this 
So these are painted, as you probably gathered, from my own observations, feeling, and mood, and photographic reference. And so you probably noticed I've been holding this paintbrush. And the nice thing about the night series is it also lends itself to all kinds of artistic tools. Whereas with maritime artwork, not so much, just from my own observations from what I've done over the years. I've tried to experiment with certain techniques with the maritime artwork, but it wasn't always a success. So I thought, well, I have all these great tools. Why not use them in the night series? You have a roller. Who would think to use that? You can use this for all kinds of great textures. A toothbrush. Sometimes that's good for spraying out a little bit of snow. Skewers are a great alternative to using a pencil. If you want to do some fixing and drawing, you can use a skewer. These are great. And tip brushes. These are so fun to paint with. <laughs> no, they aren't. Because when I start a night scene, it's always, I start out dark. I always start out dark, and I use the tip brushes to lay out the darkest values right away. And I try to make sure that I get some good energy into it with these. And my other paint brushes that are basically kind of the king of the show are the Robert Simmons Signet Brushes. I only use flats. And I've been using this brand ever since I started at the Academy. So I've been using this brand for 25 years. I love these. These are so great. Good quality. And I also use, for the smaller detail work, I use some Princeton brushes. They're the synthetic sable, zero and one. This is as small as I get, other than the skewer. <laughs> and then, oh, my other favorite. So the painting that's downstairs is a Twilight Romance, the one that won first place, was primarily done with auto body spreaders believe it or not, and also paper towels. These are fantastic. These blow palette knives out of the water. <laughs> if you want to make a big batch of work paint, which I like to do, fortunately for me, I have a, a rather large palette table with a large glass palette on top of it. So I can pretty much, you know, have a lot of fun. And these are great. If you want a hard edge, if you want to scrape something off, if you want to create a cool little line, these are great. And they have a little bit of give to them, so you can bend them around if you need to, which is really fun too. And this trusty palette knife, I've had this for a really long time. This, our friends, these two, this palette knife basically made that painting. And then kind of the, the oddballs, this is pretty stiff. The spatula, but it's great for hard lines, scraping things off if you want, just making a big mark if necessary. And then this one, I think this is from the hardware store. And this is just, I just a random brush because I thought, yeah, well, it might be fun for texture. Try it out, see what it's like. So those are my, this is, these are all my tools. I basically use. So you use the toothbrush or that wider brush to do the snow downstairs? Um, actually, that's a combination of a little bit of toothbrush. The, the large painting that's downstairs, the square one, I like. That has a combination of toothbrush and also a number two brush. Just this. This over and over and over. Very light. Let the, paint, let the paintbrush bounce. Just find a nice little rhythm when you think about how the snow is around you and you just mark it. You can spin it around because when you see snow falling, it creates its own structure. And sometimes you have big clumps and sometimes you have waves. So that's that. Now my palette, 
I have a limited palette. I have nine colors and it incorporates warms and cools. I have titanium white, lemon yellow, cadmium yellow, permanent rose, bright red, permanent green, manganese blue, French ultramarine, and burnt sienna. And this is a palette that has developed over the years for me. I originally had actually a more limited palette and it was based off of John Stobart because he had a palette that I gravitated towards. It was warm, it was light. Ooh, such a nice, nice palette to start with. And then I realized as I started the night series, I wanted to do more color theory because it's there. You have the cools at night and you have the warms at night. So I started to incorporate lemon yellow. And I was so excited how lemon yellow just transformed my world. It's a magical color. It's a miracle color. When you think you don't know what color you want, you think it's not there, try some lemon yellow. The next thing you know, it's wow, that's the color I was looking for. Such a great color. And all of the all the darks are from their French ultramarine and burnt sienna mixed together. That's the base where I get all that rich richness. Do you tone your do you start with a toned dark and go from dark to light or um for your nocturnes? Actually, no, I don't. I don't. I just recently started to put an undertone in. Uh, Twilight Romance downstairs has an undertone of lemon yellow. So, yeah. And that was that one was fun because I used paper towels for the little glow of you know the fireflies that are in there, and I also used paper towels. In this painting, if you look really closely, if you have the opportunity later, you can see just ever so slightly when you take a paper towel, you fold it up, and you do a little triangle, and you have the, the corners that create a funny little like wing shape, and you just play with that, put that on the paint. And of course, you, you play around to see if you like the, the consistency of the texture. And you just tap and dance on your surface. The other thing about my work is I also make my own panels and I also make my own frames. So when I started out the academy, I was strictly canvas. I was such a purist that way. I was like, I'm a canvas. And then I realized, I said, like, hey, you know what? There are other ways to paint. You can mount canvas on the panel, which I graduated to that. I really like that. And then I realized, hey, I like how stiff a panel is. So I got rid of the process of mounting the canvas onto a panel and started working on MDO. This is called medium density overlay. This is a half inch plywood and it has paper on the front and paper on the back. And the reason why I like using this is because one, it's a written surface and two, you can write all the necessary information that you need for your piece. The sad thing about this is, since it's half inch, the larger you go, the heavier it becomes. And that's where I evolved to working on sand fly. This is lightweight, it's quarter inch, and I also make my own cradle panels, so I give it that thickness of an inch. And the nice thing about having your own wood shop is you can make any panel size you want. So I have that luxury of being able to play around with shapes, play around with sizes, and also play around with my own framing. I get all of my lumber at RBS here locally in Uncasville. It's called Riverhead Building Supply. That's where I get all of my poplar. That's what my frames are made out of. And also the bracers on the back of the panels too. When 
you say that the plywood is the, the wood, made of tan wood? The plywood? Yeah. It's called sand ply, and it's from Ecuador. It's quarter inch for eight by sheet. It's um, probably about twenty-six dollars. So. Is it waterproof? Yes, and waterproof. apply four to five coats of gesso on each panel so and I sand it between each layer. So. I have a print sample if you guys would like to check that out. You can see what my profile looks like. And I make them as I need. So I usually don't have stock on hand. It's just a matter of out of when when I'm ready to print a piece. The piece that you're looking at right now has an oil finish, and the interior is golden acrylics, which is a fabulous, fabulous paint. And I've discovered that I can actually use that as my finished paint now. For years I've been doing an oil finish with which takes Two to three days for the finish to actually be done, meaning it's a 24 hour dry time between each layer. And that takes a lot of time. And when I want to produce a painting and have it framed right away, you know, time is of the essence. So I learned I can use the golden acrylics on these frames, which is really wonderful. It still gives me the opportunity to experiment fun, not only in the studio, but also the wood shop. The beauty about the night seas for me is they're not done on a timeline. They just happen. It's a very instinctual process, and I stay true to that. I believe in that, and for me, I think the most important thing is to paint for yourself as an artist. And the night scenes for me really speak that. So when I leave home, when I go home tonight, I'll probably drive around town just to see if anything catches my eye. Because it's the perfect time. It's not too late. And it's, you know, it's dark. And you never know what you might see at night. Do you glaze a lot? Uh, sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. Not often. But sometimes I do. Um, this paint. I think this one has, if I remember rightly, five or six layers in the sky area. Will you take us downstairs for a little tour and just say yeah. something that you can think of for sure. each page? And if you have any questions, are, are welcome, please, by all means. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. I just didn't know if you start like with, with the sky, like, uh, like more like a royal blue or something, and that keeps bringing the layers of the darkness in there so that some of the lighter blue shows through. It seems like it's a little dark around the edges or mm -hmm. purple. Or right. There's a good painting. There's a good example of that downstairs. Of yeah. The painting. I Silent never Night. looked at it. Yeah. Silent Night, the, the yeah. large one. Yes. Yeah, that has, I think, about three or four layers. And that's a combination of permanent rose, French ultramarine, and then gradually introducing some manganese blue heel. Yeah, blue. Another magical blue. color. Right up there on the plum and yellow. Yeah. Another magical color. Yes. Um, yeah, the automotive, um, you call it, it's a plastic thing. Yeah, auto body spreader. And where do you get those? You can get these at AutoZone, and you can usually get a group of three for about five or six dollars. Okay. And these are great. Sometimes I use these for applying my gesso as well. So just because it you know, pushes the paint down into the grain. So, and I like a smooth surface. So. 
these are great. You should add these to your row. And that's so the automotive. Yep, an automotive. Uh, AutoZone. And auto body spreader. Okay. Um, can you have, do you, or do you have, a difference in uh, uh, glazing time? Or let's just say different, the, the surface when you finish, do you find that there are some differences you need to even out? And do you use a glaze at that point? Um, I would have to say with the layers that I put on for the skies, especially the clear night skies, mm -hmm. probably three to four layers. And when it dries, you know, I wait about, when the painting is complete, I wait about two weeks and then I put a coat of varnish on. You do? And that, that creates what, that wonderful What do you use? Uh, I use Gamblin, Gambar, so that's the uh, the varnish I use. Flat, matte, or do you? I use gloss. You do? I use oh. gloss. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It brings out the richness of all yeah. those great deep yeah. colors. So. Any other questions? Do you yeah. own your um, desktop? No, I don't. I keep it pure white. Pure I don't know. White. Wow. Yeah, pure white. Yeah. Yep. And I think for the night painting that's downstairs, the large one, Silent Night with the Big Blue Sky, that just allows more light to come through since French Ultramarine and Permanent Rose are rather transparent. It just allows that light to pass through the pigment. So you get that luminosity from it. It's great. When you do a, uh, like a night scene, like these right here are really, really dark in that one too. Mm -hmm. Do you put all dark? down and then put your lights on top of one smooth dark or do you paint in like say all the do you paint all the buildings in and then and then paint the sky in and the really dark darks in last or how, how do you construct that so i start out dark when there's a night scene like this. yes totally dark i start out dark and i always start yeah. from the top down yeah for some reason that I just I like that process to work down. And for the lights, it's just a matter of not touching that area. Mm -hmm. So I leave the, the white of the, the panel. Yeah. So you draw it out first. Yeah, sometimes. Draw sometimes first, I draw it out so first. You know yeah. Where to stop the dark. Yes. And where the lights are gonna begin. Yeah. And that's the, you know, the auto body mm -hmm. spread. And then you put lights on top also after the painting. Yes. Done. Yes. You put yes. your lightest lights on. Right. Now, with, yes. So you mentioned that on the, one of the street lamps, you put the snow. Mm hmm. Um, no, not that one. Sorry. The summer one with the fire one. Yes. You said that one was yellow. Yes. Um, and then you, the whole ground was yellow. And mm -hmm. then you painted the night all over it. And the fireplace. Yes. Yeah. So what I did was where I felt like I wasn't sure where I wanted to put the fireflies in that painting at first. I had an idea, so I, I made a kind of a, a loose circle around where I wanted that. And then with the paper towel, that's when I played around pulling in the dark into the light and then taking the light and pulling it into the dark. If you look really closely, you can kind of see the pattern of the paper towel, which is really mm -hmm. fun. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you mix black? No, there's no black. So you mix it all? Yep, so I mix it all. Yep, I have no black. People are often surprised by that. And the reason why I don't use black is because it's flat. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to add depth into black, and that's the beauty of French ultramarine and burnt sienna. Because you have the cool of the blue and then you have the warm of burnt sienna. So you can pull where you want the darkness to go if you want it to be cool or if you want it to be warm. And if I want it to be very rich, like in Twilight Romance, then I add permanent green and that just saturates. Permanent what? Permanent green. Oh. So, and I use, I use Winsor Newton Artist Oils. I've been using those for years. And if I happen to run out of a 
specific color. I tried my fallback is gambling. So, but I I've been using this palette for like I said since since college. <coughs> so, and with besides permanent rose, what was the other red you used? Bright red. Bright red. Bright red. Yeah. The name has changed over the years. With Windsor Newton, it used to be called Windsor Red, and then they just changed it to Bright Red, but it's the same pigment. Okay. How does it relate to cadmium red? Is that how are they yeah. different? So um, cadmium red is hot, whereas Bright Red is a little bit more neutral, cool. but it's warm since it's red. It, so it's yeah. cool, it's, it's cool. Yeah, right. so, yeah. yeah, if it's compared to cadmium red, yes, it's cool. Yeah. But it's a beautiful bright color. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was that under red? Was Permanent that? rose. So Permanent. once again. So is that cooler red? Yes. Okay. So titanium white, lemon yellow, cadmium yellow, permanent rose, bright red, permanent green, manganese blue hue, and then French ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. That's nine colors. And the hue works for you, the magnesium hue? Yes. It's wonderful. Such a good color. And I recommend if you're going to use that color, use Windsor Newton's because it's creamier, whereas Gamblin's tends to be a lot drier, and it doesn't have the same power as the Windsor Newton. So. Oh, I also use in my turf, I use refined linseed oil, and I also use stand oil as well. So I mix those into my turf. And you, it looks very smooth, so you don't use a softer, like a, a camel hair to like smooth out the nope. brush stroke, because nope. you use kind of rough brush, you know, the yeah. print stand up. Yeah, I only use bristle. There's something about bristle that I love, and if you get, if you hold it just right, and you have the consistency of the paint just right, you can make it smooth and soft. Mm -hmm. so. And then you also have, depending on how well you treat your chip brushes, these can create a really lovely soft effect too. So if you clean these often, and you take care of them, you can create a really lovely, and it's all in the light touch. So you don't need to have a, a wispy brush to have, you know, a light look. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, seeing as you only have a nine paint palette, uh, obviously you come up with some wonderful results. How do you record the uh, surprises you end up that you want to keep for the future? <laughs> how, do I, how do I record the surprises? <laughs> so when you make your combinations of paint to come out with the colors that you want, how do you, how do you retain that? information for yourself in the future or are you just weighing it from there? Um, I would say it's probably a combination of just for having a memory for how the colors were reacting on the palette and also the painting itself is, is a pure dialogue. It's an individual dialogue each time. So I would have to say I'm pretty good at being able to recall what colors I, would, I can mix. So. so you don't keep a chart? No, nope, I don't keep a chart. <laughs> no, I should, probably. No, I don't, I don't keep a chart. Any other questions? Please. Can you use your brush to put the varnish on or do you spray? Brush now. I use brush now. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much.